<laughs> silent, awkward silence. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is the podcast number two from the Microsoft EMS community on Discord. And today we have some new faces. And today we have uh, Sihan that was on our EMS live session. We did, I think it's a month or two ago or more. I don't remember. Uh, the time goes so fast, but uh, glad to have you here, Sihan. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Just like a couple of lines and maybe also, you, you know, you have a great post, a great blog. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jonas and uh, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Shehan. I'm coming to you from um, Adelaide, South Australia. So it's a bit early for me for this podcast. But yeah, it's interesting to um, talk something um, something interesting uh, with like-minded people. Um, yeah, so as uh, Jonas mentioned, that's my um, URL uh, to the bl uh, blog which is uh, shehanperera.com. So I usually talk about um, a lot of identity management, a um, bit of security, um, and a lot of Intune stuff as well. So anything that comes um, uh, new or um, any any of my um, um, findings as well. So I talk a lot uh, there in my blog. And you can find me uh, in LinkedIn as usual um, as well, uh, slash Shehan Pereira. Um, yeah, so that's that's me. Uh, so I'm working as a consultant at the moment um, in Microsoft 365 space. Anything that throws into my way usually um, and specifying in the device management area. Yeah. Awesome. By the way, Shehan, can you tell me a little bit about what is your focus on your blog? Because I've seen that you like you got some really good stuff in there. You got I'm just watching like your blog right now. Um, but are you more like yeah. identity or device or where are we in the in the scope? Yeah, a bit of everything I would say uh, in the enterprise mobility and security um, uh, space. So um, identity and access, a um, bit of security as well as the Intune device management as well. So I try to blend in everything uh, together um, and try to come up with like you know, if you want to give one solution, I try to come up with a bit of identity security as well as uh, device management uh, in my blogs. Awesome. Yeah, and see your latest blog is is, uh, is about organization messages uh, to push uh, important messages to your users. That's your headline. <laughs> that's a great um, feature. Yeah. I oh, that's not, that's a tag. Sorry about that. That's a tag. Yes. What's <laughs> yeah. on the tag right yes, there? Was, yeah. Uh, so I was writing about um, BYOD, how to manage your Azure AD registered devices, which usually uh, people don't um, think that much because you have your registered devices, um, the BYOD devices, but if you want to restrict or put more um, uh, regulations onto those devices, so I wrote a blog about that the first that actually a, a two part series the first one was um, how to block uh, BYOD uh, completely uh, and um, things like that so the second one is if you want to manage your HUAD, HUAD registered fleet uh, this is how you do it so like my my insights and everything that's great yeah I like the I like when you're like splitting up to, like making new parts like part one and part two because the subject is so deep right yeah 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 okay so. yeah yeah and and tools Glad to have you here. Yeah, hello everyone. And I know you're also blocking, and you're also an MVP, and Shihan is also an MVP, right? Yeah, you both are. Um, but yeah, yeah, tell me about yourself, Rose. Yeah, no. So I'm uh, my name is Trus. Uh I um, I work as a security engineer in a security operations center. Um, I'm not so much focused on uh, mostly my interest in EMS is. Uh, security detection so it's uh, Microsoft 365 defender mainly and then compliance of devices and how it fits into that but that's very new for me I'm mostly an Azure guy or on on-prem uh, background from uh, the Norwegian Armed Forces and been doing like okay. Active Directory since 2003 so um, yeah or since the Active Directory, like Windows Server 2003, not since 2003, I was <laughs> barely old enough to form a coherent thought at that point. Um, I know, the, I know yeah. the feeling, like I yeah, say stuff yeah. all the time that is that is wrong, <laughs> and yeah, just without yeah. thinking, yeah. No, yeah. so yeah, no, my 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 focus is mainly on on automation, um, so things to do with like CM and uh, SOAR, um, Azure Lighthouse, and things like that um and yeah that's uh, that's mainly my focus if you look at my blog it's mainly uh things to do with uh 
design of uh, MSSB access solution. Um, it's to do with uh, how Lighthouse works and how uh, Azure Sentinel or Microsoft Sentinel, it's called now, works. Yeah, so that's and, mainly and mainly the focus of the blog. Yeah, and I seen I seen your your post that is I want I want you to steal my job. And I say it again, I want you to steal my job. That's that's an interesting headline. Yeah, I'm very interested mm. in uh, in uh, how people learn and. I've been giving throughout my entire career, I've been teaching a lot of courses and uh, trying to help people learn. And then I've understood that I learn in different ways to others. So some things I will pick up really fast based on like seeing pictures and command lines and then other people will have to like um, learn it a different way. So it's it feeds into how you sort of like write your stuff. So I'm writing my things for myself. So I would sort of like target the the people who want to have a job like me and who thinks like me, and they will probably see like, oh, this is straight to the point. Um, but it's, mm. uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, I don't like writing very long stuff. I try to keep it as short as possible. Often I have, right now I have a bunch of things I haven't been able to post because they're too long. So I try to cut them down to like synthesize it, but it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard going, uh, attacking your own stuff with a scissor. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you're doing a really good job. And I also had I also told James to just show a picture of, like you said, you want to see show it as pictures. So I want to show one of your your, <laughs> your drawings. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it's very. Uh, there's no fancy mm -hmm. designs here. It's just uh, yeah. Whenever I'm, I need to visualize something, and I was like, can I just steal a picture of the internet, or do I need to actually uh, draw it myself? So I uh, <laughs> I drew it myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this but is plan two or plan one? Plan two. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new plan three. Yeah, <laughs> this is plan three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. exclusive. It's all the infidels, right? Yeah. No, I, I, I like it. I, I like that you're also open-minded, and you like you're also saying that's why I brought it up that you actually said in in parentheses, I think it's in English, uh, parentheses in Danish. Uh, I really am an artist, so you also have the the self-reflection and that okay. I can, I'm not an artist, if that's, yeah, that's what you're trying to make, yeah? You're putting yourself yeah, out no, there, that's what I'm trying to say, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Oh. No, it's a lot of the, um, I think a lot about the blog space and the, the MVP space, uh, a lot of it is you're seeing all these long-time MVPs and a lot of these long-time bloggers with really fantastic series and posts, and then you're afraid if you write something similar, it's going to come off as mm. a rip-off. So uh, mm. I had... Uh, talking about artists, I read a really good book called Steal Like an Artist, which is basically everyone steals and takes inspiration from stuff. You just assimilate it and then make it your own in sort of a different way. And so I think it's a really good point to just say, you know, just go mm. with it. Just just try to share. If people like it, they'll like it. And then if it's the derivative in some way, then hopefully that makes the people who wrote it in the first place that you're stealing from really proud that someone would go to the length of stealing their stuff so that's that's only good so uh, yeah yeah i like the view on on, st um, on those things like that because yes i also read blogs i also get idea from other people inspiration and and then i put my own kind of thinking on it and then i put out a blog and um, i do that often actually uh, not going to lie about that Okay, work, working yeah. in the same space, right? It's yeah, exactly. All exactly. Reading the same things, listening to the same stuff. So, yeah, trying to be the first guy writing about new tech. Oh, it's the it's like a marathon. Marathon, you're never gonna win, right? <laughs> okay, but today, uh, I want to put some focus on hybrid identities. So before we be started recording the button, as I told. Uh, these guys here, I'm gonna again be open about it. I'm not that prepared as I'm, as I wanted it to be. So uh, we're gonna put, do it on how do you say like a, a cowboy? Like <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that was a joke. Okay, not funny. Uh, but <laughs> high intensities. <laughs> now it became funny. Awesome. Uh, but hybrid identities is yeah. The topic, the focus on it is the thinking of um, hybrid. Uh, device hybrid and uh, user hybrid, all of it in between, and the mindset around it, I will also say a little bit. 
Um, but in my eyes, when we talk about hybrid, uh, we, f we forget devices and we probably, no, we, we think about devices and we probably forget about the users. But hybrid identities and identity is both a device and a user identity. But what are your thoughts about hybrid identities, guys? I mean, it's a, it's a necessary evil, right? I mean, most orgs that are, even if they're, they're trying to go cloud native, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be hybrid if you've had active directory for any amount of time. Right. Um, mm, mm. and I think to your point, even if you're going to Azure AD join and, and you're going cloud native devices, you still have that hybrid identity, which honestly, right. There's still gaps in my eyes, uh, where you can't easily convert like if I want to take James and make him a cloud only user, right? And he's currently hybrid synced, right? It, it's a bit of a pain to sort of go through that process. So um, mm. not a good solution for it yet, that I can see. Well, um, <clears throat> well, let, let's take, uh, take it from an, an environment's perspective. Um, mm. For us as a consultant, um, how many of your customers are actually cloud only at this moment? In my case, I think it's less than 5%, which Very is cloud shit. only. Yeah. Good yeah. Point, yeah. Yeah. I, I really would like to have it, uh, to be the, 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 the other one. So let's say 95% is cloud only and 5% is hybrid, but the environments are not ready for it or, or people are just installing servers over and over in time and you can't get rid of it. It's mm. so difficult. One thing I really hate is uh, missing the automation part while using a hybrid identity. For the, for example, uh, onboarding new employees. It's, it's it's so easy when you're using a cloud-only environment, but mm. probably, ah, I really hate this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like, like, I also want people to be on, on the cloud, of course, but it's a necessary. I don't. I won't say any more. In my opinion, that on-prem is evil because it's again necessary right uh, in some ways depending on the environment uh, it's utterly pivotal to most existing businesses right if they yeah. have we, we have for, uh, yeah for example we have for every customer we have a different onboarding approach the procedure is totally different for each customer while well, using azure id for example mm -hmm. it's completely default for everyone. It's it's the same over and over again for every customer. It's, it would be great if everyone has this, but it's it's not possible. No. Yeah, no. sometimes what I've seen is um, even the customer would like to move into like a full cloud solution, but the thing is they have a lot of history and links connected to the on-premises. So in yeah. that case, even even they have the they have the vision, they can't really do that. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's a journey though uh, it's you've got to identify which bits make sense to to try and go cloud native and mm -hmm. uh certainly uh, as far as i see it devices are usually the first things that you can try mm -hmm. um and there's there's a lot of uh confusion i think around the word hybrid because there's multiple mm -hmm. scenarios in which it's used Mm -hmm. um, hybrid you know, apps, hybrid uh, devices, uh, hybrid users. Yeah. yeah, you've got a hybrid identity. Um, mm -hmm. You've got a hybrid Azure AD join in terms of bringing your existing devices into, you know, some form of cloud management. Then you've got hybrid Azure AD join autopilot, which is mm -hmm. not great. Um, and I think a lot of people just use the word hybrid to mm -hmm. mean, yeah, and it could, it. I think it gets lost in in translation uh, exactly which one you're. Hybrid one a workplace. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It means mm -hmm. lots of things. But I, I will say when it comes to like the quick wins with uh, the hybrid identities, I will probably say that's going to be that on device side uh, with the devices when you deploy a device. And I know, James, you have a lot of opinions about hybrid, uh, hybrid SAD join. Uh, <laughs> and we probably all have. Uh, but I will say a quick win in hybrid. And when it comes to devices, that is pr probably going directly to Azure AD join, right? Or am I completely wrong? Yeah, I think I that's true nothing. because um, 
you have your GPOs and everything now coming up from like Intune as Intune policies as well. So that's a main um, no no back in the day saying no, we can't have um, we don't have anything um, in Intune, so we can't do that uh, like going fully cloud. But it's not the case mm. at the moment. So you could just have pretty much everything um, in Azure uh, in Intune. Mm. Yep. I think it, it does depend on on the complexity of your environment or you know every, every different environment. I've certainly seen a lot of customers who could be cloud native that aren't for reasons that uh, you know it, it's more of a, a learning thing or, or uh, you know change of mindset thing. Um, but also customers that environments are are just yeah there there are other things that need solving uh, to be able to get there. Um, cause there, there are some blockers to, to be going, um, cloud native devices. Um, yeah, things like 8021X stuff that revolves around a AD device object. Mm. Um, yeah, when I, when I look you, uh, at it, yeah, sorry. Hmm? Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, I think though, James, you bring up a good point in, um, the, the mindset. I mean, I've <clears throat> certainly had customers who, you know, would say things like, well, I still have to have active directory for my servers or group policy for my servers so it, everyone keeps trying to go with this like it's all or nothing sort of mindset right and and mm. having to start shifting things and, and honestly right getting into almost this more agile approach with uh you know devices and identity and and all that but didn't mean to cut you mm. off there jonas no it's it's fine it's all, all good. That's that's what I'm here for. I'm just trying to like <laughs> get the conversations going, but I'm too fast sometimes. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to put also some focus on. So now we have the devices. Now we have the users because I have actually uh, a case right now where we want to put identity governance on the table and put hybrid user identity on it um, with the identity governance. Uh, but we still need to have identities inside our on-premise AD but we want to have our Azure AD to be the primary IDP, right? Um, so we are right now looking into uh, yes. the HR system that is populating the, the users. Or let me, say, let me say like this, we have like an app that is kind of populated with let's yeah. say Power Automate uh, or something else or Power Apps and then populated over to the HR system. And then it's gonna from, from, from there go to the Azure AD. And from Azure AD, it's going to go down to on-premise AD. Yeah. Kind of, still, hmm? kind of a user right back feature. Yes, user right back. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that Microsoft actually supporting user right back right now, right? I think right. it was. It was, it on was there. Uh, back in 2015, I think, but they removed the, this feature and I don't think it will ever return. Is is that not the um, one of the intended uses of the new AD Connect Cloud Sync? Um, like Microsoft just preparing stuff to make AD the primary source. Truth? I mean, that, I that's what I mean. That's what I think. I think though it is interesting because you see that there's some support for LDAP right back, but they, at least last I checked, were specifically stating they excluded Active Directory from that. But hmm. I don't know. I mean, for anyone that manages FIM or MIM or whatnot i i think they've they've got to get user right back into uh active directory if they want to kill that so yeah because i like that deal have the the motor on in the back end like identity governance have that put on it um for clean up house cleaning and, and stuff like that yeah. uh, but i know they have group right back membership uh from isn't it yeah it's user group right back they have enabled now on each azure ad group in Azure AD, so which I'm just missing the the last little thing that is going to be user right back. But maybe I can also do something else, create the user on premise, and do some connection with the unique IDs in a way, create it both on both ends, and then connect them together. Yeah, I don't know yet. I'm still figuring it out. Joys of being a consultant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> trying to connect the dots, right? Put a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> the the next the next thing I wanted to put a little focus on that's for to get you out here at holes, uh, because as, as you said, you also talked about uh, on-premise security, right? If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, 
Uh, oh, no, so, right. so to hybrid security, right? Uh, what is your connecting those two things? How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, if you want to say my question. question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I do at least. Uh, and you can correct me if I misunderstand it. No, I uh, before I started working in the security operations center, I worked as a penetration tester doing mm -hmm. mostly penetration testing on, on Active Directory and networking. And so a friend of mine that I, I talked to recently said that if you're installing a domain controller in 2023, you might be rethinking what you're doing with your life. Um, but it's um, <laughs> over, I think, uh, in our incident response team, they said something like, uh, the, the thing we see in common with all of these attacks, it's 95% on-premise AD, right? It's the common mm -hmm. denominator. So from a pure security standpoint, it's um, connecting your, let's say, uh, very secure uh, cloud-based authentication service to this very, uh, uh, it's basically held together by a tape measure, like a tape at this point, right, uh, Active Directory. Once you connect those, no matter how diligently you go about it, it's gonna pose sort of like a, a breach threat, no matter what you're expanding your attack surface. So mm. it's, you could secure your AD domain all you want, but it's the fact of the matter is that it's gonna just expand your, your attack surface. So I was thinking about it when you were discussing it earlier, like when you, uh, when you connect it to, so it's the only thing you can really do at least from my perspective, if it's gonna be used by normal users. So mm. you had the, the red forest sort of like, uh, uh, concept of Active Directory with multiple tiers and workstations, that's impossible to to manage and to keep up to date. So the really only thing you could do is to uh, like use network segmentation, right? But uh, security monitoring on the on the parts where you feel exposed, and then uh, shuffling everything up into the cloud as fast as possible, and then. Again, someone mentioned it's not a all or nothing approach, and that's very true. A lot of people, when they do security, and that's one thing that me as a security person, I think a lot of other people can agree, we're hard to work with because it's either everything should be secure and screw everyone else, or it's, yeah, don't bother, mm. right? Yeah. But it's, uh, you should try to work in like a, a staircase method for this and everything else. It's, it's, you should start with like, the basic security stuff and then work your way upwards, uh, agile, not do it like, okay, we're, we're starting a project in six months, we're gonna be the most secure company on the planet. Won't work, right? So it's, um, I might've missed the answering the actual question, uh, that's, but it's, the, it's that's fine. how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's a consultant talk for, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to answer the question at least uh, out, out of curiosity um what do you see the um the most prevalent attack vectors from cloud to on-prem being is it privilege escalation in the cloud to get to something on-prem or, or yeah where um yeah no so so the first like the injection point is uh we see is uh, mainly phishing Mm. Um, obviously, uh, I think we just, uh, published a, a report on this actually, which I can, I can get you later, but it's, uh, it's mainly phishing as the, the main point of access. And then, uh, it's going to be very different based on the, on the firm, right? Because it's, it's different operate. It's, it's a vague answer, but it's some people will have like a virtual machine, um, with a managed identity, which has access to something and then there is an application running on that server, which has access down to the on-prem environment, right? There's a VPN tunnel, something like that. It's it's all very different. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, I, I think there's a great blog post called, I don't remember if it was Spectre Ops that wrote it, it's called Death Room Above, where they they sort of go through this uh, from, from Azure into on-prem thing. And I, I would uh, recommend anyone who's sort of like looking into this specific attack vector from cloud to on-prem, then I would, I would suggest looking at that blog post because it's really interesting. Uh, I can't remember all of it right now, but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's mainly to do with just grabbing, uh, grabbing tokens and relaying them, but it's, uh, mm. yeah, there's a lot of things, but we don't, I don't think we've seen any, 
at least not on our customers. We haven't seen any specific like uh, lateral movement from uh, the cloud to on-prem, at least not yet. And now that I said it, I uh, suppose I should <laughs> knock on wood, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great answer. Uh, and that, that's in my head, it also starts the, the discussion about workload identities uh, in Azure. Uh, for some yeah, because it didn't, and this might be just off topic, but they just did, uh, I don't, don't know if it's very new, but they just had the workload identity, uh, I'm not sure if it was conditional access, but the identity protection, yeah, which yeah, is good. in preview right now. And then enabling that would allow you to do uh, conditional access um, for the identities, which is very nice. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I've, uh, as far back and I remember, it was a big uh, a big request for people to actually make some conditional access on workload identities. Um, and I also think on my last part, not on, on this podcast, but on Twitter space, uh, I also talked with the program managers and also suggested that we, knew, we need the cloud intelligence, intelligence as well as we have on our users uh, for these workload identities. Uh, because some of them are dynamic and some of them are pretty much doing one thing. But yeah, dynamic, dynamic I mean, like doing multiple things at once. Um, but I think it's it's great that it's coming on 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 the table. Yeah. Anyone want to add something to workload identities? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. It's at least for us. We we run a lot of our uh, systems are pushed by workload identities, and so we've identified use cases where oh. If our um, workload identity were suddenly to log on from another place, it would mm. never do that, right? So that's there's a lot of cheap um, conditional access you can add, like oh, it should only be allowed to log in from this very specific IP address, which is our static IP address, and that's I think um, very easy to do. And then you have things like obviously, uh, if you can avoid using uh, service accounts uh, in this day and age, you should probably mm. do that. But for some systems, they are necessary. Uh, you can't avoid it. And then so you could do similar things to the service accounts where you would uh, say that oh, these, these are only allowed to log in from certain locations. Um, and then you would basically rule out anyone uh, finding credentials and logging on from another uh, locations because you could limit them to the the allowed locations and then obviously don't whitelist all uh, Azure IP addresses um, because yeah that's another problem but I, th I think it's a really strong tool I think conditional access is uh, one of the best tools for just account security and now also workload identity security that you can have if it's implemented correctly mm. agree how many uh how, how often do you see it implemented correctly <laughs> no that's <laughs> it's it's very easy to do in a small tenancy so if it's a very specific use tenant uh it's easy to implement and if it's a big like uh 3000 employees tenant it's very hard to implement but you can limit it to say uh i want this conditional access policy to be only for azure management but so mm. far, browsing through it, I haven't seen anyone do it like that. Um, so it's no, it's a very complicated thing. But you could say, uh, if you want to have uh, Azure management, you can only do it from these IPs. And then also, you could roll it into things like user risk and stuff. But it's uh, yeah, no, very complex conditional access policies. It's going to be like similar to uh, an Active Directory Red Forest in terms of management, because if it grows too large, then no one's going to be able to maintain it. But it's uh, at the medium size, it should be easy to implement for everyone. At least I think so. It's it's not that complicated to do, and there's very many good resources for it. Yeah, and that, that's that's also what I'm thinking of. Like, start with the IP, right? What do you want to communicate with? Uh, that's probably the the quick win, right? Yeah, I think I I did a presentation on this, and my top three ones were the uh, allow listing of 
uh, IP addresses and block listing of them. So that's the name locations. <laughs> yeah. And then there is um, the block legacy authentication does what it says it does, right? No mm. questions. And then the last one is compliant devices. And then you can have a uh, different level of device groups with different level of access. So it's similar to a like privilege access workstation implementation, but just having a compliant device for accessing files, right? So mm. uh, depends on the size of the firm. If you have like a lot of employees who's just using like email and Teams and SharePoint, and they're always on the go, Maybe you have to be a bit more lenient, but it's yeah, it's uh, it should be implemented no matter what at some level at least. Yeah, and and now we touched on the the concept of the mindset changes, um, but on, on that point, how uh, how do everybody else on the on the call deal with that um, inevitable um, a company that's been doing it this way and. Uh, trying to win them over to uh something that i'm sure yeah we all know is is better and more secure but um those those more difficult conversations to uh to change people's mindsets on on things interesting how how other people deal with that one uh well maybe i have a good one <clears throat> today today i had a discussion with a customer who said we don't want our users to have mfa when they are in the office. What's your mm. opinion on this? So it I, goes against zero I, trust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's the only answer, I think, yeah. And yeah, I really didn't know what the answer, because why not? And if you have an, like an, an Azure AD joint device, you're logging in with Windows Hello, what's the issue? You always mm. have a token, so it doesn't matter. We don't see it as a user. So why wouldn't you configure your users to use MFA? I don't know. I, I don't like trusted locations, by the way. There's actually never a trusted location, never. Even your office isn't, to my opinion. Hmm. Yeah. Um, do, do you think them not wanting MFA is because in their minds, like every time they try and do something, they're going to get a phone prompt or god forbid an sms text saying that you know prompting for it is it a mindset thing do they think something's going to happen that actually isn't or yeah or maybe using a personal device to receive an sms or a pop-up from the authenticator app maybe that's an issue could be it, it, it might be the not loud phones in the office <laughs> yeah yeah or there's yeah. no signal um i've had situations like that here with um like contact centers and stuff where yeah, yeah. it's like against uh you know regulatory stuff that yeah. means that you can't have a mobile phone or gov uh, government agencies you know yeah. that kind of thing i think it's um you know one of those areas where it, it kind of gets into like organizational change management and stuff mm. that's not necessarily security related and you know i think combining it where but I mean, you, if you talk to a customer sometimes and um, uh, you have to understand, I suppose, like their business reasons, right? You you see people that would go in and just be like, right, you need to do this or else you're stupid. And that doesn't really, um, you know, help oil the gears at all there. Um, uh, yeah, but like that uh, in particular with like ProSci where they, they have the ad car model, it's, uh, you know, awareness, desire knowledge ability and reinforcement and like to, to me that awareness and desire piece of things right um and kind of combining that with you know who you're talking with is it you know c-suite it pros right um hmm. uh, and, and helping them understand like why they want to have this stuff and you know there's other mechanisms right you can get uh you're sort of like um champions right onboarded get those people that really want this stuff you might not be able to talk to finance as well as getting the people in finance that really want to be on the cutting edge in, right? And they're, they can go help tell their peers about how great, you know, passwordless is or, or something like that. So, I mean, it's like a whole topic in itself, but just, uh, 
Yeah, I think yeah. uh, you're correct, Eric, uh, on that point. Uh, we did the same thing in my last um, employment. Um, so we talked to the, the C-level first and the managers um, and made some champions out of it. And then uh, we got them to um, do the do the, the do the news for the for their for their for their peeps so uh, in that way it was really easy for us to um, implement mfa um, organization wide but there were a few users who were reluctant to use their phones because it's uh, uh, we would say personal phones so we had to come up with a different solution for them which, which can i ask you Shihan, which solution you came up with um so uh, the t-top is that correct um the the device that you get um oh, what you call, okay, yeah. um the digits yeah yeah yeah, the token, yeah yeah the temporary otp yeah yeah um for a few devices and then we had to create um then the user guides for them how to use the uh, the key and everything um luckily there were uh, uh, like uh, resellers in australia uh, who does uh, the t-top i think the t-top devices i can't remember the the brand name uh, but that's one of the azure ad recommended um devices um device brands as well so that went well for us yeah that's, that's a good that's a good like combination of like satisfying everyone right yeah yeah to meet your goals hmm? i think yeah that's, that's right yeah yeah uh, that's one of the the things that's that's getting better that there there are options it's you know if you know if you want to implement something but there are certain scenarios like that if if you can provide something that yeah um, w whether we want to go into it is uh, what's better the MF mfa authenticator app or, or sms it's it's going to be the authenticator app but in a scenario where you have to do something and there are situations you know surrounding not being able to use something having having other options available is better than not having anything at all right agree that's yeah, back to the back to the Twitter uh, stuff that just happened, right? If you all know, I know, I know, of that, I know of that. <laughs> the, yes, sir. Uh, that. <laughs> I, yeah, charging actually, I, charge your employees if they want to use uh, <laughs> weak uh, <laughs> authentication. Uh, spicy, actually, spicy take there. <laughs> I'm putting myself out there again, but I actually wrote on Twitter about that uh, that SMS was uh, uh, stronger than uh, OTP, right? So I, I misunderstood the question. So I fall directly in the pit hole. I have to like go back and say, oh, I misunderstood the question because it was some kind of, yeah, it was from, uh, what's it called, Backer, uh, the Azure AD guy. Um, uh, I don't remember. Uh, Jan Backer uh, from Holland. Joe, you know him. Um, and and he, he wrote about getting your blue markers on Twitter weaker MFA. But I think it's about the the money perspective in, on this one. But let's pack that and leave it at that, uh, because um, what was I trying to ask about now? Yeah, back to the, the name uh, name location, Joey, because um, you just you talked about name location, whitelisting, and all of that, uh, and whitelisting part. Uh, because I remember that if you actually go in and whitelist, not whitelist in a conditional access, but if you go in and, and name uh, IP address as a name location, as a trusted location, it will don't also have an effect on the AI you're building up in identity protection. So you don't need to go in and whitelist it. You can just edit your IPs if your, of course, your internet is managed. Um, so use it like that. Uh, I don't. I agree as well that whitelisting IP addresses is for the people that have misunderstood how MFA is, is properly being used and also someone that had implemented MFA, right? So I know you need to have a bigger license for it, but as the, in the Azure Premium P2, but com combining the cloud intelligence with authentication um, so you can remove the factor of whitelisting. And what are you guys thought about the cloud intelligence on identity protection? And like, like yeah, in overall, uh, in a way, doing it dynamically. Just trying to throw out an open question. Some some hard, something is something is being grabbed. Sometimes fall in the pit, right? So, what well, like the the user and sign in risk type yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I I haven't had anyone that's um, uh, gone and implemented it. Um, it. It's yeah, even after they've opened up E5 licensing, um, it's kind of fallen down the list of things that uh, are important to do. Mm. I think that there are probably quicker wins within that E5 or the ADP2. Mm. License, yeah. I've seen um, like a, a one org. I think it was like Citrix or something. They're running where we ended up adding, you know, some range to named locations, mostly because they were hitting issues with right impossible travel. And I know there's like the the learning period within it, but there was something where it seemed like it wasn't going as uh, as expected. Where uh, you know, when they were going in through like Citrix, they were getting hit with a you know impossible hmm. travel sort of uh scenario but yeah no we had a bunch of at least for the for the security operations part we also had a bunch of uh, impossible travel uh this was from mcas or uh, microsoft's uh cloud app security or now defender for cloud apps um whichever name you prefer but uh, <laughs> that's i, I still names. have uh, difficulties wrapping my head around how Azure AD identity protection, user risk and sign in risk, which also have the impossible travel things. And then you also have Defender for Cloud Apps, which will throw you the impossible travel. Uh, and they do integrate at some point, but I had to dig very deep. Uh, I remember I answered a question about it uh, sometime, and I had to Google for hours to find how it integrated and what data was. But it's um, there's a lot of false positives there and it depends on the usage pattern of the the company some if you have uh we have customers that travel a lot use vpns and they will hit mm. the the thresholds every time so what we sort of did with it uh, we have the identity protection enabled uh for most uh, normal tendencies like uh, our own we have it where we have conditional access tied to high risk so if you have high risk you will need to reset your password uh, mm. and mfa but you have to do it at the the, the office location and things mm. like that so it's it's just another part of the and then also if you, you're using a high risk sign-in which is a one sign-in uh, basically if it's a new computer or it's a new location you've never been at at a weird time it will hit and give you a high risk for that sign-in and then we will uh, also block that so it's it's not a, a fix all or it's not a very like what you call it the low hanging fruit with big gains but it's it's possibly uh, at the right moment it could be a boon so it's I, I would say if you're on top of a lot of the the lower uh, like easier to implement things then it's a good thing but it's it's uh, yeah no it's some people might generate a lot of risk and I, I'm just experiencing talking to people and seeing like big tenants. There is a lot of like normal office worker who generate a very large amount of risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it might be hard to implement properly for, because that's another like, uh, I, I guess, business management thing where people wouldn't like being locked out all the time. And then they would complain that security is making it hard to work again. So it's, yeah. It's hitting the sweet spot there, but it's a way of like like getting the the whitelisting over out of it, right? So because people are trying to whitelist stuff because they don't want to be prompt, but that could be a factor to actually speak about dropping the cloud intelligence and talking about user risk and signing risk. Uh, yeah, I don't think you should ever like allow list anything to um, drop MFA or drop prompting. I think that's a bad idea. You should never, ever drop multi-factor identification for anything. Um, the If you're doing an allow listing of a location, it should only be in addition to MFA. There should be a big number, and this depends on how secure you want to be, there should be a big number of policies, and the named location is one of them, and then it's a part of a bigger picture. And then at which, I think it's a very, really easy quick win to implement uh, named locations uh, compared to something like user risk because user risk needs to uh, be implemented and then uh, maybe in 
like report only mode and you have to see the usage pattern of the uh, like uh, organization you're working with so it's it's going to take a bit longer to implement and then you're also going to have to handle the outliers uh, as support cases so it's i think uh, yeah it's uh it's two very different things the azure premium p2 when you activate it now like it will still have data from months back <laughs> uh, yeah that's a fun little thing but oh yeah so you can see yeah. you can see sort of like how it would have impacted things oh, okay that's nice um but let's go i know the time is going fast uh, and i want to actually hop down all the way down to our last topic uh the cross tenant sync if that's okay <clears throat> with you guys sure because and then i wanted to put someone on the stop on the spot and i know shihan that you made a great great blog post about it uh if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why I wrote that because um, a long time ago, again, in my previous employment, um, so the company I used to work with, they used to um, uh, acquire a lot of other companies as well. So they all had M365 tenants and as a solution specialist, I had to give all the solutions on the go as well. So, but we didn't have any day one solution for those users were coming mm. in so it was all about um, uh, adding them as guests getting them to accept the uh, the, the prompt uh, the authentication uh, consent and then um, give them the access and then again it didn't have it didn't uh, support a lot of um, features um, even to access the sharepoint if i can remember right um, you have to make the guest as a member um, then only they can see all the other uh, sharepoint stuff as well um, so that was a bit of a um, bit of a um, bit, of, bit of an issue with the with the management, either to create uh, so where to create the users um, in which domain controller in which um, company, so uh, or to have two accounts uh, in both places. So that was one of the challenges. So I looked at uh, at that time um, a way to get the the auto redemption done. Um, funny enough, uh, I think when the guest access first came in, uh, the, there was a script that you can implement in your environment. So um, the redemption will be done automatically. Uh, so the user doesn't have to do the uh, mm. consent. I think uh, obviously because of the security concerns, uh, they have dropped that. Um, and that was the situation until, until recent times. Um, and then now you because you, you can just trust the Azure AD um, tenants. Um, yeah, that's a great feature, uh, right? So the claim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think um, as long as both parties have the feature on, um, you can get the auto redemption done. So that's a good thing as well, apart from the whole Azure AD synchronization part. Um, but I'm not sure when with the synchronization um, whether they have to enable license in both places or just the other tenant would um honor the 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 let's say the the, the other tenant um mm, tenant b for question. example yeah uh, but i think it's it's a much much needed much needed uh feature uh that i've implemented uh, yeah so i love that from a business perspective i think it will be that they need the license in both tenants <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah i know they would honor the 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 mfa um the yeah. hybrid yeah uh the compliance i guess yeah yeah also um, compliance yes yeah a few stuff right. yeah 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 i have a, like a, a big subject here yeah sorry eric no i was just going to ask what is uh, i'm actually looking up with the uh yeah so it's p1 i was curious what the licensing requirement was for the uh mm. oh, for the cross uh, uh tenancy yeah oh, okay yeah. yeah and 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 another thing I wanted to say about is the ISV companies, because I have a good a good customer that is ISV. They made their own product in Azure AD, and they rely on 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 B two C on on their tenant uh, with their app. And and when they saw that they allowed uh, users to trust their own ten tenants, uh, it's a B two B. Sorry about that. Their own the other tenants cross tenants MFA claims. They were like so happy because now people don't need to enroll to MFA in their tenant. So imagine you have enrolled yourself in your own tenant, and now you need to enroll yourself in another tenant. That's uh, so it's a it's a big big plus. Um, yeah, and I think with this one, um, yeah, yeah, one of the other challenges that 
they had at the moment i think even up to date uh, most of the most of the companies would have uh, who have like two or more microsoft 365 tenants um they have the teams uh, chat um issues with like switching the tenants every time but i think with the um i think when you do uh the trusting part um you can do the shared teams uh, shared channels without any issues so that's a very good thing as well i hope that they will expand it to uh, uh to other other stuff in the teams as well so you need to have a um shared team channel to do that specifically uh, but yeah so that's a good start and uh, what's your opinion on uh, guest access reviews uh, combined with cross tenant sync? Because, to my opinion, if you're using cross tenant sync, you should always use guest access reviews. True or not? I think, yeah, you have to. I'm not sure. Trust for flex test. My opinion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, Especially yes. when you're adding to all the other groups as well, let's say to, let's say, SharePoint it can be a team. So, yeah, our reviews must be done periodically. Yeah. I get a shock every time when you switch it, uh, screens, James. You go from oh, right. uh, <laughs> having a small picture to like All getting your fit. own face in your yeah, your eyes. Yeah. yeah. I actually That's think a... that not many people are using guest access reviews. Actually, are you guys using it? It's, it's quite a... simple to implement, but it's kind I have, of. I have a use case actually. I can speak from. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, SQL uh, on their. They have SQL in Azure. Uh, they are now using Azure AD to authenticate to this SQL for the developers. But now we can also combine it with identity governance and access reviews uh, because you need to be in an Azure AD group to get access. Uh, mm. So we, we took it up in viewer group, uh, contributor group. Um, so people can go in when they want to work on a subject, they need to go in and request this access pa packages at the access package. And then they need to have like some kind of review from someone. And mm. on time, after time, it will also be an access review at some point, right? Um, I think, uh, Joey, on, on guest guest access review, so uh, if, if you're doing various bits of collaboration, um, but uh, maybe you haven't done anything for, for a while, that, uh, that user that has previously been collaborating is no longer needed perhaps in in the mm -hmm. tenant but there still exists as a guest right and in, in yeah. identifying whether you just remove that that access if if they haven't you know logged into the tenant to do anything right i actually follow the recommendations from microsoft in this case because if microsoft says this user hasn't logged on for like 90 days we should remove it then i remove it that's actually what i do mm -hmm. it, it's maybe a bit tricky but you can always re-invite someone so it doesn't matter actually yeah and it also keeps your tenant a bit clear uh, no messy users who are never logging in anymore it's actually a, a very simple feature but really effective it, it, and it's actually simple to implement except for the organizational uh, stuff you need to go through but i like it I always have yeah, I ha yeah, I have seen tenants where a lot of clutter when it comes to guest access, uh, and after some time, no one really knows who they are, and no one really cares mm -hmm. to yeah, and no one wants to delete exactly. as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, just browse uh, to just browse to a, a a random tenant and see how many guests are in there who actually never log in anymore, or mm -hmm. who left the the company where they are working for. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody's it's, it's good you, yeah nobody's nobody's really informing you that one of their employees is leaving <laughs> so yeah you, you should do it it's uh i have a uh i guess a horror story but i i implemented the access reviews a while back um and for some reason i forgot to um i set all of them to review and then no action and then our management team would do the review but i forgot for our one of our teams, I set it to be automatically removed. So over the summer break, when they came back, oh, no. no one had access anymore to anything. And I, was like, hmm, I wonder what happened there. <laughs> so it's um, yeah for guest access, it's it's you can just invite them again. So that's fair. But for people who actually work in your company, you might want to uh, not remove all their access automatically, especially if it's over the summer and some people might be working. So uh, yeah. Oh, well, you, did you have, yeah, sorry. 
Uh, or, or if somebody's on, you know, long-term sick or paternity leave or something. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Did you have the time to, like, go in the grace period and recover the users? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, it was, uh, we, we figured it out the same day it happened. So I was able to uh, okay. restore all of them quite quickly. But I had to, I have so many access reviews. I had to go through them all and just check what the settings were. So the... I guess I, I do agree with the fact that setting them up uh, is a bit of a hassle. So that could probably be improved with a bit of uh, better filtering and selection for when you're setting them up. But it's, mm. it's still a good good thing to do. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking about a requested feature. I don't know if it exists. I don't think it does. But that's inactive Azure AD groups. <laughs> that is not being used for anything. Uh, I haven't found a way. Uh, so no uh, group expiration. Oh, okay. Well, expiration will hit what just M three sixty five groups, but I mean you could still do access reviews right on groups if you know the owner and mm. just basically trash yeah. the the group if. Mm, okay. Interesting. All right, guys. So. I know we've been talking for how long now? I think it's almost an hour, right? 56 minutes. 56 minutes. Uh, and if you also have Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Andrew, you want to have something to say to the, to the last, on the last minute? I've, I've been listening quite happily. Plenty to learn. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, yeah, sometimes you have something to say. It's because in a subject that is your expertise or whatever, uh, but you're going to be here next time. And I hope so, though. Uh, but I want to end it now because we are almost going for an hour and we had a lot of other subjects to talk about. But let's end it here. And thank you for joining and listening and all of that. And remember to participate in our in-person event on the 13th of April in Denmark at Microsoft. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye-bye.